Hello, everyone. Can you believe this is actually our last lecture of the spring? Where did the time go? I want to take this opportunity to thank our program committee for the wonderful lectures, the eight lectures. They've done a great job on bringing us very informative, interesting topics. And I think that's fabulous. Secondly, I want to thank CCTV for without them, we couldn't have brought these wonderful lectures to you. So thank you, everyone. The last thing I wanted to mention is that we will be sending out an email to you this weekend asking for your feedback on the last four lectures. So please just hit reply, type in whatever you want to type, and then send it off. That email will come to you from Glenn Roa. So thank you in advance for your cooperation on that because the program committee really treasures those responses. So having said all that, now I'd like to ask Mike Lorlansky to please introduce today's speaker, Michael. Thanks so much, Carol. Today, we're very pleased and honored to introduce Kelly Hamshaw. She's a senior lecturer in the Department of Community Development and Applied Economics at the University of Vermont. Ms. Hamshaw earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Natural Resource Planning and her Master of Science in Community Development and Applied Economics, both at UVM. She's now nearing completion of her PhD program in Natural Resources, focusing on, focusing on climate justice for rural communities. Her research is being carried out in a partnership that includes UVM, as well as McGill and York Universities in Canada. For more than 10 years now, Kelly has designed and taught undergraduate courses and service learning experiences that are among the most popular at UVM. The university has recognized her achievements with a number of prestigious awards, including the Krepsch Maurice Award for Undergraduate Teaching and the 2021 Distinguished Senior Lecturer Award. Kelly lives in Bristol, Vermont, and she is a lifelong lover of horses. She fondly recalls as a fifth grader mucking stalls at a neighbor's barn in exchange for a pony ride. Currently, she has a retired racing horse and is learning the principles of classical dressage. The title of today's lecture is Vermont's Mobile Home Parks, the front lines of climate injustice in the Green Mountain State. Please join me in giving a warm Triple E welcome to Kelly Hampshaw. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, so much. And thank you, Carol and Kevin, for bringing this opportunity uh, to share a bit about the work that we do um, in CDAE, um, working with a great um, variety of partners around the state, um, working on mobile home park resilience. And just thank you so much, Michael, for those very kind words. I'll go ahead and share my screen. It's great to meet everybody um, here at the end of your semester of lectures. We're still um, about six weeks away from the end of our semester at UVM. So we're looking forward um, to some warmer days and brighter days ahead as well. So um, thank you, Michael, for sharing the title. We're gonna be looking at um, a work, piece of work that we've been um, really underway with for really the past 10, 11 years now, looking at the resilience of these often invisible um, communities across our state and many rural communities elsewhere in the country. Um, a bit more about um, some of the work that I do. This is a picture um, from a class that we taught um, the first semester of it was the fall of 2011, right after um, Triple Storm Irene hit Vermont um, in August 2011. And we were able to get a class on the books um, in no shorter than 48 hours um, to be able to bring UVM undergraduate students out into the field um, and be part of the relief and response efforts. Um, and our connections with mobile home park communities enabled us to bring students where some of the needs were the greatest um, on the ground. And so I share this example as just um, something that really um, allows me to be able to fuse my passion for rural community research along with service learning and really um, meeting urgent community needs on the ground. So you'll hear a bit more about that work um, infused into the research um, work that um, that I've been contributing to during my time um, at UVM. So a bit about the presentation that we'll um, spend about the next 35 minutes or so um, delving into is to get a little bit of background about what we mean by climate justice and vulnerability and resilience. We'll then look at um, what's going on with mobile home parks, um, both at across the country and both here within the state of Vermont. 
And then we'll do a deeper dive looking at Trouble Storm Irene, those impacts 10 years ago, um, and how those communities, some of those communities have actually um, recovered and changed and what that looks like today. And then as we continue um, to feel the burden of the housing crisis across the state, what's important for us to consider um, as we move forward. And I'll close with some acknowledgements to some of the uh, research partners that have been um, engaged in this work on the ground. Um, and then we'll have plenty of time, um, about 10 to 15 minutes or so at the end um, for questions and answers. So um, looking forward to that um, at the conclusion of this presentation. So starting with thinking about these concepts of vulnerability and climate injustice, as we know, climate change is impacting um, communities all around the world. In Vermont, uh, we are seeing um, in ex increased extreme participation events, um, temperature fluctuations. Um, certainly, if you're talking to a maple sugar this week, um, probably hearing a bit about a bit of lament about um, our weather patterns right now. Um, when we think about climate change as a global phenomenon. We're really looking from a justice perspective at who's bearing the greatest impacts of those changes. And so we're looking at those um, at the local level, looking at those impacts on those populations who are most vulnerable um, to, um, to these impacts. And so when we think about natural disasters, particularly those that are exacerbated by climate change, such as terrible storms and hurricanes um, and other related events, we're looking at a disproportionate impact. So more burden being shared, being borne by um, communities of color, lower income households, individuals with compromised health conditions um, that were already there. So these um, existing structural inequities that were already on the ground well before any of these disaster or climate related events impacted them. And so when we're thinking about um, climate change here in Vermont, um, and thinking about um, climate change um, and the, the impacts of Tropical Storm Irene, it was really a major focusing event um, for seeing these changes uh, and these impacts um, on these particular um, communities of mobile home parks. Um, about 20% of the US population resides in rural communities. So it's not an insignificant um, percentage of folks that are living um, in rural communities where mobile homes happen to be an important part um, of that rural housing stock. Um, however, when we're looking at the literature and what other researchers are doing right now, um, there are pretty significant gaps in understanding climate justice um, and who's vulnerable um, in these particular um, communities. And so there's been some work looking at income, looking at poverty status and other key demographic variables, um, in particular looking at occupations in rural communities and how those factors um, can both drive um, vulnerability and also try to um, also increase um, resilience. And so some work um, growing in this area over the past 10 years, but there's still much more um, to understand uh, with these questions. So doing a little bit more of a deeper dive looking at mobile home park communities, we recognize that these um, parks are really an important part of the unsubsidized affordable housing stock for homeowners all across um, the United States. Often, again, understudied um, for a number of reasons. Um, in these park communities, typically, and this holds true, um, especially here in the state of Vermont, most people own their own mobile home and yet lease the land under um, on which their home sits. And so the park owner, whether that's a private um, developer or a nonprofit or a resident owned cooperative, they own uh, the land and are responsible for the infrastructure like water hookups, um, electrical hookups, the roads, um, all those key um, kind of park-wide infrastructure, that responsibility lies with the park owner. However, the homeowner um, largely is responsible for everything above um, the ground. Um, and in this case, when we're talking about mobile homes, you can purchase a new one um, straight off the dealer's lot for around $55,000. Um, and of course, there are um, plenty of models that can be um, more expensive than that. Um, in Vermont, most of our mobile homes are actually um, bought on the used market. So sometimes folks are paying $15,000, $20,000 in order to move into um, a mobile home within a park that's already sited on a lot. And that is an important piece that we'll come back to a little bit um, later um, in the presentation. We know that about a third of all mobile homes um, across the country are placed in about 50 to 60,000 um, parks um, spread out um, across the US. The reason why we say 50 to 60,000 is because nobody really knows exactly how many parks um, we have in the country. Different states have different um, um, expectations in terms of tracking um, these communities. Some states like Vermont 
actually have an annual registry. So park owners are required to essentially um, register their park um, and provide data about lot rents, vacancies, um, number of um, homes um, within these parks, um, but other states have absolutely no um, data or tracking mechanism um, for these communities. So it's um, a pretty rough um, estimate, I would say, of those 50 to 60,000 parks. Um, and uh, while most parks still in Vermont and across the country are uh, considered to be private um, land lease communities where there's a private owner um, who's running it as a for-profit um, park, we do have um, parks where residents have formed a cooperative and we'll, um, we're actually looking at one of the relatively newer cooperatives on the screen here um, in Shelburne, Lakeview Cooperative, which um, transitioned to cooperative ownership in 2019. Um, you're seeing a growing number of, of those sorts of um, organizations where residents come together in order to purchase their park outright um, from their uh, previous owner, and thus protecting um, and managing that park um, together um, from other um, potential um, redevelopment um, purposes. Um, we also have, um, especially here in Vermont, um, a large number of parks that are owned by nonprofit housing entities and therefore are uh, managing them um, to be an important piece of our affordable housing um, stock here in Vermont. The American Planning Association, so this is a major um, stakeholder in 2001, issued a policy fee um, calling mobile home parks an increasing problem. And for two main reasons. Um, one was really pointing to the fact that many of these parks are built in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. And as those parks have aged, major infrastructure um, concerns have become more and more um, apparent. And so that could look at look like wastewater challenges, um, drinking water supply issues, um, roads, certainly electrical hookups um, within the parks. And as those infrastructure um, elements get older, they're very expensive um, to rehabilitate. Um, and if for communities trying to um, keep their rent affordable, it's very difficult uh, for park owners, even with the best of intentions, um, to be able to reinvest um, in, in those infrastructure um, challenges. And so that's been a main driver of why parks have been closing um, across the country over the last 20 years, is that when parks get to this point of needing major infrastructure investments, oftentimes the um, park owner might look to another um, you know, use of that property and then completely remove that park from the housing stock, um, leaving people in very vulnerable positions relative to if they could move their home. Um, we often talk about mobile homes being an oxymoron moron in terms of they're really rather immobile. Once they're placed on their lot, um, contrary to what many people might think of um, for a mobile home, they're often there for um, e either the rest of their lifespan or maybe could um, withstand maybe one or two moves over their entire lifetime. Um, so that leaves homeowners um, in these situations where they might have to pay five to $8,000 if their home is indeed um, structurally sound to withstand a move um, or um, abandon it altogether and lose their home um, in, place, in times when parks are facing closure. We also know that these communities face pervasive social stigmas um, in our socio-cultural understanding of how these communities function. There's really a lack of, um, I, I would say, nuanced understanding of how these communities function. And that's something that we've been trying to do over the past 10 years or so, um, is to share a bit about the opportunities in addition to the challenges that we know um, about these communities. We often will see exclusionary zoning practices, um, not so much in Vermont because we have um, legislative, legislative protections that prohibit communities from outright um, keeping um, parks out of their zoning and planning. Um, but elsewhere in the country, um, you can certainly see mobile home parks kind of pushed more and more out into the fringes of communities. Um, and that's been well documented elsewhere. Um, because of the homes being expensive to relocate or structurally and unable to be relocated, residents really have very little leverage in that relationship with their landlord or their park owner. Um, and so that leaves them um, oftentimes in really challenging situations when it comes to addressing maybe community dynamics or um, advocating for improvements being made to park infrastructure. And then finally, I mean, maybe the focus perhaps of the majority of the rest of this talk, 
is really looking at the fact that some of these parks, um, whether we're talking um, vulnerability to flooding or looking at um, wildfires or heat exposure, some of these parks are, many of these parks are located in areas that could be deemed hazardous. Um, and that's what we're gonna take a further look at uh, next. Uh, before we get into the details of that, I did want to share a little bit about what the context looks like in Vermont in terms of um, the number of parks and the number of folks who call these communities home. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're really fortunate in Vermont to have the um, Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development actually be able to track on an annual basis where our parks are. Um, so we have address data, we have um, number of lot rents. Um, you can see here we have right now 235 parks, which is actually a decrease over the past 20 years or so. So every year or so, we tend to lose a few parks here and there for a variety of reasons. Um, but we still have about a little more than 7,000 lots um, within the state of Vermont. So that's 7,000 Vermont households calling these parks home. Um, and we can see that with a 4.8 vacancy rate, um, there actually is quite a bit of demand for these lots, um, particularly if you're looking in Chittenden County, Addison County, um, Washington County, even um, lower vacancy rates um, in those places. Um, generally speaking, we think a, uh, most housing um, experts will say that a 5% vacancy rate is sort of the ideal uh, metric for a healthy housing market because it gives people enough choice um, to be able to have options when they're looking at um, where to either site their mobile home in this case, um, or if um, you could apply the same uh, metric to looking at apartments. Um, so unfortunately, um, most folks um, in Chittenden County, especially right now, um, really would have a difficult time um, finding a new lot if something should happen in their park. When we look across the state, and this certainly varies again by county, just depending on um, different housing pressures and the housing markets um, are highly variable across our small state. Um, but on a statewide basis, the monthly lot rent uh, that someone might pay, and in most cases, people own their homes outright, um, but their lot, um, lot rent is only $360 um, per month, and that will cover their hookup to the water, wastewater, kind of everything else beyond um, their home. And so many of the folks that we've talked to over the years when we're doing door-to-door um, -door survey work um, out on the ground will often say um, that they're able to enjoy other pieces of, um, enjoy other aspects of their life because their lot rent is much more manageable compared to what they might be paying if they were living in an apartment, um, in addition to other things that they um, frankly enjoy um, about living in their mobile home in terms of having control over their own four walls that they don't have to share um, with a neighbor if they were in a condo or an apartment complex. Um, and so that theme was really strong um, when we're doing those door-to-door -door, um, interviews with people um, and, and talking about their home. Um, and that's something that often goes, I would say, un underappreciated um, when we're talking about these communities uh, with a wide range of stakeholders. Um, this graphic um, is from the ACCD um, report that they publish um, every five years. So the last one was published in 2019, looking at um, kind of the, the overall snapshot of, um, of our parks. Um, in the state. And so what this graph um, is really telling us is that the vast majority of our parks um, in Vermont are actually relatively small. So having fewer um, than 10, um, 10 homes within a park. And that can be um, really, um, really a wonderful thing for folks who are living in those parks because they know their neighbors so well, they could be a tight knit community. Um, on the other hand, um, and maybe things aren't so um, pleasant, that can be a really isolating piece. Um, but certainly from a viability and resilience um, lens, is these parks, um, these 81 parks that have fewer than 10 lots, it can be really challenging um, to manage in terms of um, investment and reinvestment back into these parks um, and just the, um, the year to year um, upkeep um, of these because they're not generating oftentimes enough um, income to be able to take care of some of these major infrastructure um, challenges. Um, we do have a few parks, so about a dozen parks that have 100 lots or more. Many of these are located in Chittenden County, um, but also down in southern Vermont. Um, and so those parks, um, we'll actually take a look at one of those um, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, and even at that point, they're still struggling um, with some of the um, financial viability of these communities in the wake of climate change. 
Um, you may see um, in the news, um, this was a clip from seven days just last month um, that we have been enjoying um, in Vermont, a number of resident owned cooperatives transitioning from private ownership um, into um, the um, co-op model. Um, and so most recently two parks up in Colchester actually just converted um, to resident ownership with the support of the Cooperative Development Institute, which works with parks all across New England and Northern New York. Um, and the CBOAO mobile home program, that would be the Champlain Office um, of Economic Opportunity, um, which serves um, actually the statewide mobile home residents um, with support from ACCD. So um, if you're interested in learning more about those parks, um, and Wallace Allen has been doing an amazing job um, chronicling um, these most recent developments with mobile homes. So I want to transition now to talking about the impacts of Charcoal Storm Irene. I mentioned earlier that was a major focusing event for major for most Vermonters and thinking about climate change coming home um, and really highlighting the vulnerabilities within this unique housing stock um, in some of our most rural um, communities. And so for those of you who were here on August 28th, um, 2011, um, you might remember, uh, particularly if you were more in Addison County, where I'm sitting here in Bristol right now, um, or maybe up in Burlington, we had a lot of rain, um, certainly in a very short time period. Um, what this map is showing you, if you were elsewhere in the state, um, you're seeing um, these white dots are some of the 235 mobile home parks across the state. The red ones are the ones that um, really took the brunt of the damage um, from Chocolate Storm Irene in terms of um, flooding. Um, we had six storm-related fatalities across the state. Um, 13 communities were completely isolated in terms of having roads washed out. Um, and there are about 3,500 homes, single family homes, rental homes, and mobile homes in that number that FEMA tracked as being da damaged or destroyed. When we looked at um, the parks themselves, and at this time we were actually working on a three-year USDA grant, um, which gave us um, some, about a year or so before Irene, um, gave us some time to start collecting data to be able to even produce a map like this. Um, at the time, um, the mobile home program at CBOIO simply had a map um, of the state of Vermont and it had um, little push pins on it to represent where all the parks were. Um, and so with this um, USDA research grant, we were able to hire a GS consultant to help us make these maps and actually um, digitize all of these address records um, and make that data available to a range of stakeholders across the state. Um, we really had no idea how important and how relevant this work would be, you know, just a year um, in um, a year into the the project being started. Um, and so quickly, um, we mobilized on the ground with our community partners um, to be able to visit some of these parks um, and help FEMA actually um, identify where some of these parks um, were were really um, experienced quite a bit of. Um, flooding. We worked with case managers to help provide um, some background um, on, um, on the unique um, characteristics of mobile home park communities. Um, and by the end um, of the theme of registration period, over 225 mobile homes were flooded. Um, of those, 133 were considered to be completely destroyed. So in, in this case, um, folks were completely oftentimes um, lost maybe everything that was in their home, maybe below three feet um, or so with um, all the water damage. Um, they could have lost their transportation because um, oftentimes folks didn't have that much notice in order to get out of um, their communities. And so they might've lost um, their cars um, and really had their lives turned upside down in the middle of this um, statewide really um, crisis. Um, another just important note here that I wanted to mention um, so going back to the 7,000 lots, um, we know that um, statewide um, on any given point over the last five years, about 7% um, of the state's mobile home, or state's total housing units, excuse me, um, are mobile home park um, um, units. And so when we looked at the FEMA data, um, by the end of that registration period, we actually found that mobile homes were represented, overrepresented. Um, and so coming back to that um, notion of justice, right? Um, we saw that the folks who were living in these park communities bore a much greater, um, more than double um, the burden that they should have shared if we were just looking at um, simply the statistics of, um, of what percent we might have expected them um, if it was actually equal. Um, and so in that, um, those probably almost two years 
really after Tropical Storm Irene, um, we were engaged with supporting case managers, particularly in Central Vermont with the Central Vermont Long-Term Recovery Committee, and then also supporting um, the deconstruction process. Um, a colleague of mine was really um, invested in helping figure out how do we help these residents who have just lost all of their um, all of their belongings, their homes, how do you then um, help them through the process? Because as I mentioned earlier, um, the homeowners are still responsible for their homes, um, even if the park had flooded. And so in this case, there were a lot of meetings um, in September and October where residents didn't know what to do. Um, they were still on the hook for paying no lot rent since their flooded home was still in the park. Um, and there was frankly chaos, I would say. Um, and in terms of like who to who to turn to um, for that um, for that assistance in terms of the process, um, and because we didn't have a lot of experience, I would say um, across the state in dealing with disasters of this extent, um, nobody had really clear answers in terms of where they should go. So unfortunately, we saw particularly um, some older residents in this community um, in Westons actually fall um, prey to some predatory um, folks who were. Um, charging people three, five thousand dollars to take away um, their mobile homes. Um, often, what they would do would be to show up. Um, this is um, this image here. Um, show up and strip away the most valuable materials, and then leave the homeowner after they had just paid a significant, um, you know, um, portion of their um, disaster funds. Um, they would still be stuck with um, what was left behind. Um, and so we saw undocumented um, you know, stories like that. Um, over those first three months after Irene hit. Um, we saw the difficulty and the, the real pain, frankly, um, of these um, of the aftermath of this event in terms of displacing whole communities. Um, so a number, a few parks actually closed completely and did not rebuild. Um, and then we also saw parks lose individual lots. Um, we'll take a look at a couple of those cases in, in just a few minutes. Um, the other thing that we saw that was um, perhaps more challenging um, because of the nature of this type of housing in these communities is sometimes you would run into these um, parks like in Westons where you would see actually whole um, multi-generations of the same family um, be living in the same um, park community where you might have um, grandparents taking care of younger grandchildren um, while parents are at work um, and you might have an aunt or uncle um, in the case that I'm thinking of um, where everyone lost their homes. And so that support network that maybe, um, you know, where others were turning to uh, family members um, and other communities and other um, housing that might be able to accommodate more folks. Um, in this case, um, in, in this particular community, um, that wasn't there um, for folks because their whole um, community was, um, was disrupted. And so, as intense as Irene was, one of the major questions was, was this just a one-time fluke? Um, is there really something to um, this question of our mobile home parks more vulnerable um, to climate change, to flooding events um, in our state? And so I like to remind people that before Irene hit in 2011, we actually had pretty severe storms um, that spring. And so this image that you see here on the screen is actually from a park um, called, um, aptly named perhaps, um, River Run Manor um, in Berlin. And over Memorial Day, um, about 10 homes um, were flooded in this park, um, right along um, the Stevens Branch of the Winooski River. Um, and so that really gave us an opportunity um, to convene different stakeholders from Vermont Emergency Management, from the Hazard Mitigation Office, um, the Mobile Home Program, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, um, to be able to dig further into this question and collect more data, um, like what you're seeing here on the screen, um, to actually go and look at how the location of these communities aligned with um, the available FEMA data um, for floodplains. And so I won't get into um, the specifics of how we put these layers together, but essentially working with some of the E911 data um, where we were able to identify um, where mobile homes were relative to other types of housing, we were able to create maps that looked like this. Um, for folks who are familiar with Brattleboro, um, you're actually looking at Glen Park, which was a senior living community um, located along the Whetstone um, Brook here. Um, that flows down towards downtown Brattleboro. Um, this was also um, a senior living complex, Melrose Place, which also sustained um, quite a bit of damage um, during Irene. 
Um, and so we were actually on the ground here about a week or so after the flooding and talking with folks um, about um, their experiences and what they would hope to see for their community um, building back. Um, and it was quite, um, quite extensive um, and really hard to picture because on a normal day, this is a fairly, um, fairly low, um, low volume um, brook. Um, and so it was really hard to imagine um, the velocity at which the water um, came rushing through this park, putting um, folks in very vulnerable and dangerous um, situations. Um, they had, um, the fire department was evacuating people out of this park. Um, well into the evening hours there. Um, and these um, homes that were labeled red here, um, those lots were actually permanently closed. Um, so folks weren't able to um, move back. Um, and were, again, were displaced um, from their community, which is um, particularly challenging um, in these housing markets. So the results of our analysis found that yes, we, um, we do see that mobile home parks are more vulnerable, particularly to this type of flood um, hazard. And so um, again, uh, looking at um, mobile homes within parks, um, we were able to find that about 12% um, of mobile homes located within parks have some exposure to a flood hazard area. So that could be the floodway uh, where you're basically guaranteed um, to experience flooding in events like Irene, the 100 year floodplain or 500 year floodplain um, relative to mobile homes that were sited on private land. So about 6%. Um, compared to other traditional conventional single family homes, um, which had a much lower rate of just 4%. Um, and so that um, enabled us to be able to share um, and create more of those maps to share with some of these um, communities who um, were found to have a high um, degree of their lots um, in these risky areas. In addition to those physical um, vulnerabilities, we've also looked at some of the socioeconomic vulnerabilities. Um, and I won't go over everything on this slide because I do want to get into some of the case studies. Um, but here, basically, um, uh, some of the, um, some of my most fond memories actually is, was actually taking um, our, some of our undergraduate students out on weekends. Um, this was back in um, 2011. And actually um, having conversations with folks doing door-to-door -door interviews, um, asking folks what they loved about their community, um, what was really a positive aspect of their park, um, in addition to collecting some of this data um, that a lot of our partners around the state um, really wanted um, a, you know, to get a better sense of who was living um, in our parks. Um, and so we found that generally, on average, um, folks um, were about 55 um, years um, old. Most folks had a high school um, diploma, though we did interview quite a few folks who had a, a tech degree or a four-year degree as well. Um, the majority of folks um, really um, were quite positive about their housing situation in that it was stable um, and affordable for them on the incomes that they were living on. Um, and then we also found folks um, that certainly were lamenting their high energy costs, um, also being a challenge related um, to climate change in terms of being able to keep your homes comfortably cool in the summer um, or comfortably warm in the winter. Um, when we asked people if in an evacuation situation, um, if they would feel comfortable evacuating, we found that over 40% of folks um, reported having a health condition or a disability that would be a concern to them um, in an emergency situation. And that data was particularly um, of interest um, to some of our partners at Vermont Emergency Management. Um, and, and really just finding that we had a lot of compelling stories to, um, to kind of counter some of those narratives about who lives in park communities in terms of um, the ones that are like widely, um, widely out there in our, um, in our culture. So a real emphasis really on um, families um, with at least one household member in the workforce um, that we really see quite a range um, of experiences um, in these parks. Um, and so it was actually quite eye-opening for a lot of my students um, who had never maybe set foot in one of these um, communities. And so it was really an opportunity to um, connect with people um, who have different life experiences. Um, it was particularly enriching for them. And so when we kind of think about how these different vulnerabilities interplay with each other um, in terms of the structural integrity of some of these homes, this is a home that was actually completely stripped down and rebuilt um, in Weston's mobile home park following the flooding. Um, the social connections, um, this was a wonderful um, connection we made in Weston's um, 
the spring after Irene hit uh, when Diane was able to um, move into her new home um, and my students came and um, we actually replanted a lot of her flower beds, um, but also confronting the real reality, um, frankly, of our of how um, how many parks are actually located in hazardous areas prone to flooding. And so when we think about how these um, vulnerabilities kind of interplay with each other, it gives us a much richer understanding um, of the complexities um, of these communities and being able to share that with other stakeholders and decision makers at the local level and at the state level um, has been an important part of our work. And so we're gonna let's see, just do a time check here, right on time. Um, we're gonna take a little bit of a closer look at three communities that have had really different outcomes and stories um, following Irene. The first of which um, for folks familiar with Waterbury, um, the top photo here um, was taken a few days after Irene. Um, and this was a park that was located just off the exit 10 um, ramp um, to 89 as you're going into um, Waterbury. Um, this park had 11 mobile homes in a fairly small area, um, also located within the 100 year floodplain. Um, so it was an area that was known to be potentially um, challenging in a flood event. All of those homes encountered um, substantial flooding um, over um, Irene. Um, about a year or two later, actually, that property, um, after they removed um, the flooded mobile homes, was actually purchased for redeveloping into a different type of housing. Um, and so there was a local um, developer who had this plan for um, what he calls a pocket neighborhood. Um, and so you can see here in this lower photo, um, examples of the new housing um, that was built. You can see that they're raised on piers. Um, to be out of the 100 year floodplain um, should another event like that happen. Um, and they were built um, to much higher in energy efficiency standards um, than the housing that was certainly there before. Um, these are fairly older um, mobile homes that were um, pre-Irene. Um, and with those um, raised foundations, much more resilient um, than the mobile homes that were there formerly. Um, but of course the real challenge here um, was that um, where folks are paying less than $300 a month um, for their housing. Um, these cottages were listed um, for sale at close to 200,000. And so very different um, populations, right? Who could afford um, to be able to move um, into these homes, um, even um, built with the extra um, flood proofing um, standards. And so one of the concerns here was uh, what happened um, to these folks who had called the Whaley's um, home prior to the storm. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a great way of tracking um, where folks um, went um, after um, Waterbury, of course, sustained major damages um, all across the community. Um, but for a lot of the folks that we were talking to at the time, um, they were moving into hotels, moving in with family members, um, and certainly um, having a really, um, had a really challenging time finding their next housing. Um, and I just want to highlight the amazing work that so many case managers who are serving in a volunteer basis um, to help people um, put together their next steps towards the new normal um, after this flooding. So in this case, um, a park, a full um, permanent park closure, and then a conversion into a re, um, in, back into residential, but a very much, um, a very different um, type of housing situation. Um, moving south, so back to Brattleboro, um, we're looking at um, Tri Park. And so um, when I mentioned Glen Park earlier being a senior community, um, this um, park actually, or this cooperative actually is Glen Park, Mountain Home Park, and Black River. So three different parks with combined 333 um, mobile home lots, um, which is actually about 10% of the total population um, of, of Brattleboro at the time. Um, Irene destroyed um, 26 homes, which then became permanent lot closures, so um, a significant number um, of folks unable to have the choice to even um, return to where they had called home. Um, and the Park um, Cooperative Board had actually, back in 2008, established an agreement with the town of Brattleboro to remove um, 42 additional homes from these hazardous areas as part of um, an infrastructure project. And so this park continues today to really struggle with financial challenges um, related to the loss of these park, um, of these park lots um, and the need um, to really take a closer look at major infrastructure upgrades, water bridges in this case, um, and wastewater. 
Um, and they recently actually just completed a master site plan um, this past fall that is evaluating different options. Um, this image below on the screen is from an ice jam um, from just two years ago. Um, so flooding is really impacting um, this park um, and continues to um, today. And so they're looking at um, a variety of ways to hopefully um, be able to maintain the financial viability of this park while getting people out of harm's way at the same time. It's going to take um, probably likely um, some major um, grant funding or low interest loans in order to make that happen in a way to keep the whole um, park um, affordable for the residents who do call it home currently. When we look at Weston, so this was um, one of the parks that I worked in most closely with my students. Um, they had 83 mobile homes. This was a community that was located just a few um, minutes um, from the state house um, and folks really enjoyed their lives um, in this particular community before the storm. Um, we saw over 70 homes either damaged or completely destroyed as part of, I mean, damages. Um, and the park owner, the private owner was very active and rebuilding the park and helping residents um, manage um, during a very turbulent time. They listed the park for sale in 2017 and working with the CVO Mobile Home Program and the Cooperative Development um, Institute, the park residents actually were able to work with the owner in order to purchase the park for $2.3 million. So not an insignificant um, purchase price. However, it still does not change the fact um, that the park is still located within the 500 year floodplain. And so now while they are back to being fully occupied, um, there are still challenges related to getting financing for infrastructure from some of the major um, funders um, because of their floodplain status. Um, however, it has remained affordable um, and folks are generally pretty happy um, with the way that the co-op has been managing on this community. Uh, we've done some work um, following um, a, a lot of the recovery work um, to actually think about um, how do you plan for these sorts of events in park communities. And so um, myself and um, some other folks on our team have been working with Vermont Emergency Management. We actually um, had two parks participate in a statewide um, emergency management exercise. Um, and so we worked with park residents um, to develop their own park emergency plans and phone trees. Uh, we made maps available for every park across the state, uh, along with important data relative to their flood hazard risk, um, and continuing to improve on, on these um, products for, um, for park communities. Um, and then in terms of just of moving forward, I, I wish there was an easy way or an easy answer um, to end this presentation in terms of what we need to do in order to improve um, the resilience and the viability of these important communities. Um, unfortunately, um, I think um, you know, many of us would like to say that we had um, kind of a silver bullet of sorts in order to um, really protect and improve um, quality of life um, for our mobile home park um, neighbors. Um, and so these three um, strategies um, are kind of where we're spending our time and focusing our efforts in terms of um, increasing awareness of where we do have vulnerabilities in this housing stock seeking opportunities to engage residents um, and other stakeholders in investing um, in park communities, looking at different strategies um, to look at these various dimensions of vulnerability and addressing those, and then working with partners, particularly um, at the state level, to look at ways that we can um, improve and invest in different hazard mitigation um, strategies um, for these communities. Um, so hopefully um, we're going to be able to, to talk more about, um, you know, these answers going forward um, as we really are going to be faced with um, some significant decisions in terms of, um, you know, do parks um, stay um, an option um, for, um, for community members, um, hopefully well in advance of any future um, climate event. Um, so just some closing thoughts before we I hand it over to Michael uh, for the Q&A. I just would like folks to kind of leave this really um, perhaps with a, a new or um, greater understanding of how important um, having um, these park communities um, as part of our rural housing stock that they really do. They can um, provide um, a high quality of life um, it, with the affordability component, particularly. Um, 
However, with that becomes the acknowledgement that as climate change intensifies, particularly for the communities that we've identified as being vulnerable, um, we understand that these um, communities will also bear a greater burden. Um, and so that really calls on all of us uh, to think about how we can um, invest in these resilience building strategies to really think about um, taking care of our neighbors um, and really, um, I think, putting the full weight of all the energy and the creativity um, in the state to, um, to support um, our neighbors, even if maybe our home types are different. Um, and so some just some quick acknowledgments. I just want to give um, a shout out to some of my mentors um, at UVM, um, my colleagues at the E4A program, and then um, different community members um, and leaders that I've had the privilege of working with um, on the ground um, throughout uh, through their different organizations, mainly the um, CVOEO Mobile Home Program um, and ACCD, and then a couple of my undergraduate students who've um, been working with me on some of this work. So, Michael, I think I'll hand it over to you for the Q&A uh, moderation. I think I ended right on time um, and look forward to the conversation. You did. Thanks so much, Kelly. And we do have a number of questions that have come in. So Great. we'll uh, share those with you. Would you uh, like what, me to stop my screen share, Michael, or? Um, you can stay on. That's fine. OK, great. Uh, one questioner asks, are most owners of mobile homes required to have flood insurance for a mobile home in a floodplain if they need to borrow money, or is it optional? If optional, what would be the estimated cost? And does the insurance cost for additional cost of insurance put this prospective owner uh, in a situation where he or she is just not able to, to buy a mobile home? Absolutely. So the insurance question is a great one. Um, for again, for most folks, they are not buying new mobile homes um, and they're not being financed um, with some of our traditional lenders. Um, so for, for the majority of folks that they're moving into a park maybe for the first time um, or already an existing um, homeowner within a park, um, there isn't really like a trigger point in that process that would require them um, to have flood insurance. Um, for folks that are buying new and maybe obtaining um, financing through um, USDA or some of these other um, major lenders, they probably would um, um, require um, or they would require flood insurance. Um, I don't have the current um, estimates on, on what that would that a type of policy would be. Um, but by and large, when we're interviewing folks about what type of insurance they had, most folks would say, yeah, it floods here, but it's never bad enough or it's never been bad enough to warrant um, spending uh, money on a flood insurance policy. Um, and so for most folks, even in parks where, um, where there is risk, um, they they don't have um, really the financial means um, to be able to do so. And so they're willing to, um, not so much willing, um, but they kind of roll the dice um, with that. And so we saw a lot, a lot of confusion um, when people were registering for, um, for FEMA, um, a lot of initial um, 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 kind of rejections basically because um, people were looking for, or FEMA was looking for evidence of other insurance um, you know, insured losses and folks just didn't have that. And so having to help people go through that paperwork process um, was really um, an intense part of the case management um, component of that. Okay, thanks. Uh, here's another question. Uh, how does Vermont compare with other states in terms of regulations on mobile homes mm -hmm. and the support offered to mobile home owners? Are there lessons we could learn from other states? And can Vermont serve as a model in some ways for other states? Absolutely. So the first part of your question is Vermont is actually one of the leaders in terms of having protections um, in state legislation um, for um, mobile home owners within parks. So just the fact that we actually know where our parks are, we know who owns these parks. Um, we do have um, some improved habitability um, rules that were written um, probably about four years ago now. Um, that outlines a process by which um, residents can bring complaints um, to their park owner. If they go unanswered, then they can be reported to the state and then there'll be sort of a, a mediation um, a, um, process there. Um, we also have, um, they, they have to report lot rents. And so there are rules around um, having like um, increases. Um, if increases go beyond um, the consumer price index um, percentage um, for that given year, it triggers a mediation process where the park owner has to justify 
why um, the lot rents have been raised, um, more so to make sure that there isn't um, like undue burden um, placed on placed on residents. In some most cases, um, it might be, you know, a new owner and comes in and wants to jack up the rents. They'll do so just up to um, that point um, because they know um, that if they go just a little bit further, it's going to trigger another process. Um, in other cases, sometimes, um, as in the case of the TriPark um, Cooperative, if there's a major infrastructure issue that does require new investment, that would be seen as a justified um, means um, for, for raising rents substantially. So we do have great, um, uh, we are often held up as a model. I would say the one area where maybe we look um, to our east, to the state of New Hampshire, um, is that New Hampshire has um, over 140 mobile home um, resident owned cooperatives now, um, largely because they don't have a nonprofit um, sector that has been willing to step in when parks come up for sale. Um, and so um, in that case, um, working with an organization called Rock USA, which um, was an offshoot, I would say of the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund, where they saw an opportunity to help residents organize, connect them with financing in order to um, protect this housing stock um, and put it in the hands of the residents. And so we've been seeing more of that work um, here in Vermont, um, but again, we're going to be limited um, by the number of um, large enough parks in order to make that a reality. So yes, and I would say. Thanks. Um, some years ago, there was a sponsored contest to build small houses completely self-sufficient with solar panels and so on. Middlebury College sent in an entry and won some prizes. These houses were cheap, efficient, environmentally sound, and the questioner wonders what attempts, if any, have been made to replace, quote, mobile homes with really efficient, small, but not mobile homes. Yes, that's an excellent question that, um, that I was actually just talking about with my students the other week. So um, at Middlebury College, Norwich University, um, they've, all, they've both been engaged um, and really successful with some of those design um, competitions. Um, there, there's a couple different um, factors at play um, when we're looking at mobile home parks um, and some of these alternative and really, um, I would say, um, innovative um, attempts at thinking around um, how can we take what works really well about our mobile home units and improve on it, um, particularly in the context of climate change, right? Um, and thinking about having homes that are completely weatherized and, and energy efficient and, and high, um, high quality. Um, and so in this case, um, following Irene, um, there were a lot of people that were asking that very same question in terms of, is this an opportunity now that we have um, some of the, many of these older homes um, that were located in hazardous areas, is that an opportunity to really put um, a lot of great thinking into um, re-envisioning what a mobile home could be um, and still use um, the kind of the format of our mobile home parks um, in order to accommodate that housing. Um, there was, um, and folks can look this up if they'd like. Um, there's a, a, com a small company um, called Vermod, um, so V E R M O D, um, and they um, partnered with Vermont Housing Conservation Board, the High Meadows Fund, um, to do some um, designs of replicating sort of basically the footprint of a standard mobile home because the lots are configured in these parks to accommodate this rectangular box. Um, and so they really went, I would say, put a, a lot of energy and investment um, into trying to come up with um, a unit that would be solar ready, um, have heat pumps, um, be highly insulated, be very bright inside, um, and have that come in. Um, the, the quest was to have it come in at something that's affordable um, for someone who um, maybe would have spent $50,000 on a brand new mobile home, but then we're paying, um, you know, several hundred dollars a month for electrical heat on, on top of that. And so they were trying to get it um, the price point down low enough, either with a buy down, a subsidy um, of sorts, um, or also making the argument on the ROI, if you bought um, one of these more efficient units that over time, you'd actually be saving money. Um, but what we found is that when we were actually um, interviewing residents about the Vermont, many folks were like, yes, that looks great, but I, can't, I don't have the ability, right, to mm -hmm. be able to come up with that upfront um, cash in order to get into that home. Um, even if I know 
that it's going to save me energy um, dollars down the down the road. I, I'm worried about putting food on the table tonight, tomorrow, um, and next week. And so a five year um, payback um, period was just not going um, to work for them. Um, that's not to say that um, you know those homes again in partnership with some of the our major um, housing organizations across the state. Um, they have actually been working with some of the nonprofit parks to put those units um, into parks. Um, here in Bristol, there are actually quite a few um, in our mobile home park that's located just adjacent to our high school. Um, and, and they are working well um, for folks from what I hear on the ground. Um, there was also a cottage um, kind of format. They called them, they were calling them Irene cottages. I don't think they really ever got off the ground um, in the upper valley, but they had a similar concept. Um, and you know, with, with the mobile home regulation, a mobile home park is defined as a piece of land that's configured to accommodate three or more um, mobile homes. And so there's this gray area in our protections that if we started accommodating tiny homes or these modular homes that aren't our standard HUD code mobile home built on a steel chassis, if that could actually um, be a problem um, down the road. And so that's, um, there are a lot of folks that are thinking about that question um, today. Okay, thanks. Um, our, our time is, is running a little short and I'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, does the move to co-op status make a park eligible for infrastructure improvement grants? Yes, <laughs> there's a simple answer there. Yes, so moving to co-op status um, does open up other um, opportunities. Um, certainly um, beyond, um, I think most recently in February, um, the Milton Mobile Home Co-ops, that's one of our larger ones um, um, in Milton, a great group of residents there on that board, um, really um, very energetic group. Um, they actually, I think Bernie um, Sanders' office and Pat Leahy's office actually just um, relatively recently um, announcement earmark um, that's coming to help them connect um, their infrastructure, their water infrastructure to Milton um, town water. Um, so that's a, an amazing opportunity, around $800,000 going to support that project um, that's going to increase the resi resilience of that park um, and remove some of that infrastructure um, burden on the on the park and really um, expand that capacity there. So, Is, is there any state regulation that a property owner must meet before offering the property for mobile homes, for example, the property's flood potential, their drainage, and so on? Um, that's a really great question because I think it's one that people haven't had to answer because they're just, we're not developing new parks um, in Vermont. Most of our um, parks have been in place um, since the 60s. Um, and so coming at it from a, a new perspective, um, yes, a lot of the funders, if, if you were seeking um, you know, development funds to support that, um, you wouldn't be able to place um, parks. You'd have to, um, in the same places where they are now for, for the most part, um, Act 250 would prevent you from, from doing that um, and, and other um, you know, funding constraints in terms of looking at if you wanted to be eligible for community block grants um, or USDA funds, um, you would have to have um, a, a safe um, piece of property in order to do that. Uh, but that's, yeah, certainly an interesting question in terms of um, why are we not building new parks if, if the vacancy rate is so low and that this is such an important um, piece for folks who are living in these communities. Thank you. Um, there's some interest in your cooperation with Canadian universities. Um, uh, a questioner is wondering, how did that come about? Are you working jointly with them on projects or research? Or is there any, are there any ways in which the Canadian and American uh, ways of approaching mobile home parks and climate uh, justice are different? Anything you could point sure. to? Sure. So that, um, that particular partnership is a, um, the PhD program, um, like program that I'm in. Um, it's led by John Erickson, Josh Farley here at UVM, Peter Brown at McGill, um, and then Ellie Perkins. Um, and Peter Richter at York, um, Dr. Richter has since um, retired, um, but their, their whole notion around this um, economics from the Anthropocene program is that our economic systems today are allowing these problems, um, major wicked problems, right, um, that we're dealing with um, to um, undermine our resilience and our sustainability. And so the, the three um, universities came together to be able to offer um, a cohort-based um, PhD program where they would convene 
um, students who are interested in different themes, um, my theme being climate justice. Um, and so other students in my cohort, um, particularly on the Canadian side, um, looking at um, climate justice with indigenous communities. Um, and so that's a, a prime focus um, of some of the students um, at McGill and at York um, here in Vermont, others looking at food justice um, and food systems and our economic systems around that. So it's been, um, I've, I've been the main like housing focused person, I would say, um, but um, certainly um, the programming that has allowed us to um, share about different contexts in terms of how we're thinking about um, sustainability and resilience and climate justice has been a really important piece um, of my academic journey. Um, I was able to take advantage of a three week climate justice um, course up in Canada um, at York University a few summers ago, before COVID, whatever, whenever that was, <laughs> maybe at least four years of summers ago. Um, and so that was um, a really eye opening experience for me um, and working with um, seeing my colleagues working with indigenous communities. So. Oh, thank you so much, Kelly. This was very, very interesting. We really appreciate your being here on our last day. And I want to thank all the members for sticking with us through the last eight weeks. I want to wish you a wonderful spring and summer. Watch for those emails this weekend about our survey for feedback. And we will see you all in the fall. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Kelly. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye to all.